Okay, we're finally to the 20th century. That's the new century, not the one we're in now. Uh, experiments in color and form. Uh, so hopefully this will make sense to you that a lot of the strands that were happening um, when we were looking at Impressionism and Post-Impressionism uh, will come together into some of this very new stuff that the modern artists will do. So modernist artists, when I say that word, I mean uh, the art of the early 20th century. So purity of means and practice, Henri Matisse, that's what this entire lecture is going to be about. We'll look at his earliest works. Uh, we'll look at the Fauvist works, and I'll explain what that means, and a little bit of the influence of African art. Um, so during this time, Europeans had um, colonized parts of Africa, um, and one of the results of that is that African art, um, mostly stolen, uh, was taken to Europe and the artists were really influenced by the types of things that African artists had been doing for a long time. So modernism on a grand scale, Matisse's art after Fauvism, we'll kind of look a little bit at it, not all of it, because he didn't really do too many new things uh, later in his life. So the 20th century, just to give you a little bit of a quick history lesson, uh, so modern technology radically transformed life in the beginning of the 20th century. Planes, trains, and automobiles, movies, electricity, telephone. Um, a lot of these things kind of moved society, um, kind of made things faster, uh, and they seem to make things change very quickly. Uh, so you might imagine people at the time reacted to it. Um, and I think you could relate, if anyone is older and listening to this, they think of how the internet and smartphones and things have changed things uh, so quickly. Um, even if you're younger, you can think of to when you were 10 years old, how, how much things have changed. Uh, similar sorts of changes, but even more radical in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so there's urbanization and immigration in the US. Uh, many um, immigrants in the US came from Southern and Eastern Europe, um, and they were treated when they were here as not quite white, for lack of a better word. They're fully white nowadays. Um, and another thing that we've seen, and we've already seen some of the conflicts of this, uh, the kind of fight against capitalism, uh, and then um, the other side, socialism. So a lot of the artists that we're going to look at are socialists um, in their early 20th century. Most intellectuals seem to be socialists at this time. Um, so there's a breakdown of the aristocracy in Europe. So all of these countries that have once had monarchs, um, they either uh, eliminated the, them completely or made them into symbolic leaders. So think of the modern UK where the queen uh, doesn't really have much power. Um, so another thing that develops during this time that had been developing for quite a while is women fighting for their rights and getting some of them. Um, usually in this point, if I'm doing a real life class, I'll ask the class, when did women get the right to vote in national elections in the United States? Uh, the answer is 1920. Uh, and the first state um, that women got the right to vote in uh, in the United States was Wyoming, of all places. Um, so women started to fight for um, not just being able to vote, uh, but being able to participate in society in many other ways. Uh, and throughout the 20th century, there was a kind of a pattern of women winning rights and then a reaction to it uh, where women were kind of clamped down on um, and then women tried to do the same thing again. Uh, and that comes into to, to today as well. So this is a continuing um, dynamic. So during this time, uh, a bunch of things happen in science that kind of enhance the idea that um, science is really disconnected from intuition. Uh, so one of those is uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, it had been kind of a mystery uh, since Newton had come up with his um, equations that describe gravity very well uh, and how it works. It was kind of a mystery of what it does because it seemed to be this invisible force, uh, which is totally um, didn't make sense to scientists who usually think, well, one thing interacts with another and that's how it works. Gravity didn't seem to be that. Um, and through uh, his general 
theory of relativity, Einstein was able to show how it works. It bends space and time. Um, but this theory led to a bunch of predictions uh, that seemed like complete insanity, even to Einstein um, at the time, uh, and probably weren't true. One of them was black holes. Uh, another one was that um, space is either expanding or contracting, um, both of which within um, Einstein's lifetime were proved to be true. So even the craziest um, ones that he didn't believe himself uh, were true. And how he came up with these theories is using math that was very complicated and um, actually had more than three dimensions. Uh, so a lot of these things kind of separated um, science even more so from, from uh, intuition. But some of the artists were really interested in this. So we look at Picasso, we'll see how he tries to play uh, four dimensions like um, Einstein has in his general theory of relativity. Uh, so Freud, we had talked about a little bit before. In some ways, he's the first scientific psychologist. In some ways, he's the end of, of uh, psychology not being scientific. Uh, but he talked about things like the unconscious, um, which a lot of artists are really interested in, that things like our dreams or even just like our um, the kinds of things that we would think whenever we're in a altered state, whether through drugs or just like... Um, you know, meditation or something like that, that they could reflect something that's more true about ourselves and what we're conscious of. So we'll see some of the artists in the 20th century uh, will be interested in that sort of thing. I talked about Nietzsche before with God is dead. Uh, remember, he doesn't mean an actual God has died. He just was noticing that religion was no longer the organizing factor um, for Europeans at that time. Um, but many of the artists we're going to look at are still interested in religion. Um, and there becomes this idea that develops called theosophy, where um, a lot of Europeans uh, and some Americans, through exposure to religions from around the world, from Africa uh, and from Asia, um, they came to this idea that all religions are looking for a kind of universal divine. Um, so I don't think this, true, this is true. I think religions... Uh, kind of function in different ways. Um, but many believed that the result of that was is that you could make spiritual statements that were universal. So we'll kind of see that in some of the 20th century artists. So they are especially interested in Buddhism um, and Zen Buddhism as well. And a few Japanese Zen Buddhists came to the United States and kind of exposed um, people to this. Um, but even like scientists and, and other scholars were interested in um, religions from other parts of the world uh, because they seem to represent, and this is true, like a fundamentally different way of thinking of the world. Um, and this is useful <laughs> for artists because um, they made a lot of things that were new uh, that kind of accounted for these different ways of looking at the world. So that was a lot of stuff, but all of it will come up in the art that we'll talk about. So Matisse, um, he's actually kind of older than some of the artists during this time. He's born in 1869. Uh, like Gauguin, he had a life before and then dropped it, but he wasn't quite as much of a douchebag as Gauguin. So he first studied law at Beaux-Arts under Moreau. Um, and uh, after he didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. He met some of the future Fovis. Uh, he worked with the sculptor Bordel. Um, and if you look at his early drawings, it's almost like they have a sculptural quality. In other words, he's kind of um, concentrating on the contours of the body and making them look three-dimensional. So in this figure, you almost see a male model. Uh, it's almost like he's sculpting, but he's making a, a two-dimensional drawing of it. Um, so Arneson has this thing that I really have to translate into English. This is serious art history speak. He says, simplification and contraction to the point of some distortion of perspective to achieve a sense of delimited space. Um, so in other words, what he's talking about here is really some of the same ideas that we talked about with Passage with Cezanne. Um, Matisse is really interested in the, the way that a three-dimensional illusion is created on a two-dimensional surface. Uh, so that's his big thing. He wants to 
to kind of like play with some of the ways that that is done uh, to create some new effects in art. So let's take a look at some of those effects. Uh, so he did make sculptures. Um, this one is from Rodin's Walking Man. So he does it, figure has a head, but it's the same idea. You have a body and it doesn't have all of its parts. And almost through that, it can express something more. This one's called the surf. And if you're not aware, uh, a surf just means what people that didn't own anything um, during the Middle Ages, and it's still kind of continued in some places in Europe, uh, and basically had to give everything, all of their work, the products of their work to somebody above them, like a lord or uh, some kind of monarch. Um, so <laughs> in other words, most people at work today are serfs. Um, so he's kind of going for that. And you can see it here. So if you see the surf, you think of someone who works and they don't get the products of their labor, getting the arms cut off kind of makes sense with that. So in his faux period, um, we start to see him kind of move away from trying to create an illusion of color uh, that is real. Um, and some of the influences that people had seen, artists had seen in Cezanne and Van Gogh where they were using color symbolically. Um, people like Matisse um, kind of thought of, well, if you can use color symbolically and it doesn't have to represent real life, you can just use it as the design on a canvas and just make something interesting. And it doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it also doesn't represent real life. Uh, and that's what we see with Woman with a Hat from a Chapeau. Um, so many of these artists, um, whenever Cezanne uh, Gauguin and Van Gogh were alive. Uh, there was a pretty small group of people that had seen their art, but exhibitions in 1901 and 1905 um, of their art uh, and Van Gogh's art showed that these artists were doing something new and the artists during this time period wanted to do some of those new things as well. So name Fauve, it means wild beasts in French. Uh, and this is another one that was named, another movement that was named by an art critic who didn't like what he was seeing. Um, it was in French by Louis Vossel. Uh, and he looked at the work and he said, they're wild beasts. They just, they don't care about reality. They're just, <laughs> they're just putting whatever they want on the canvas. Uh, so, um, and then in this one in Sayre, it says that one feels completely in the act of pure painting. In other words, think about how you might have painted when you were a kid. Um, like if you had finger paints or something like that, and you're like, I like this color, and I'll put it next to this color. That's kind of what the folks were doing. Um, this is like a pure kind of exploration of what paint does on a surface instead of worrying about making a picture or making something that means something. To them, the meaning comes from form. Oh man, this is a much better reproduction of the picture. Uh, you can see some of the paint strokes and how quickly this was done. But again, when you look at this face, it doesn't represent anything uh, that you would see in reality. So he kept moving, kind of like Cezanne starts out with the simple stuff and then moves on to paintings that are considered to be important. And I put it like the air quotes around it. Uh, that's what Matisse started to do. So this is looks calm, a volupte. Um, he's using those kind of like the way that during this time period, the female nude was used to, to be a symbol, symbol of, you know, everything that was right and good. Uh, and he kind of plays with that a little bit like um, we had seen earlier uh, with other artists. So he includes his um, woman with a hat, his wife, in with all of these symbolic figures. Um, and again, he's using colors they don't represent um, reality. Instead, we're seeing like maybe what you don't find to be a cool color combination. I like this color combination. Uh, but more the color combination is what Matisse thinks looks good together, not necessarily what represents um, real life. Uh, so you can compare it to Cezanne. But also kind of look back at Manet uh, and the Luncheon in the Grass. Uh, so it's his wife here. Uh, she was the woman in the hat. 
Um, and people have been using uh, the female body as a metaphor for essential uncorrupted nature. Uh, if you're getting a sense that there's a little bit of patriarchal thinking in, in this idea, I would agree so. Uh, so then the contrast to that is there's artistic creativity and masculine sexual potency. So during this time, we see develop this idea of the artist rebel genius, but also someone who, because they are a, a genius, they can do whatever they want. Uh, and part of that is um, having relationships with all of the women or men, depending on where they're coming from, that they want, uh, and basically a lack of like accountability. Um, in other words, artists are kind of like sexy, so they can do things that would normally be hurtful to other people um, and can be forgiven for that. So I don't believe in that personally, but I'm saying that this develops during that time. You can kind of see it. In the 20th century, it kept going on, even in the 21st century with rock stars and athletes and such. So this one is one of those paintings where I asked the students in the class, um, what do you think is being portrayed here? Um, what is inside of this rectangle right here? Uh, what do you see on the outside? And it's one of those things where you might think everybody's seeing the same thing, but not necessarily. So if you want to pause and take a look at it and see what you see. And then if you start the video again, I can tell you um, what classes see. Sometimes they see this as a window because it looks like a window, right? It has shutters, looks like you opened it. And some people see this as plants on the windowsill. Um, and then they see these as boats outside. But other people look at it and they're like, that doesn't seem right. Um, this is just a painting that's on the wall. Um, and these, I don't even know what these are. The other thing that's interesting is sometimes people see the shutters as opening out towards us, and then other people see it as opening inward. Um, and <clears throat> Matisse would appreciate the conflict in these types of um, interpretations of what's actually in the picture. Uh, because like Cezanne, he liked to play with what was flat, um, and what was three-dimensional and what was in the background, the foreground, and make it so that uh, if you looked at it carefully, everything's like, right, maybe there's one interpretation. Um, but if you keep looking at it, you see other ones. Um, so we really like the kind of like visual tricks of um, showing things as in the foreground, the background, and then them switching places in a way. So this one, again, more about the color scheme. Um, might not find it as the most <laughs> appealing color scheme, um, but Matisse um, did. I actually like these color schemes. So this one was the last one um, to kind of like sum up his fauvism period. Uh, this is called The Joy of Life. So you, everyone knows that in French, Joie de Vivre. Uh, so, According to Jansen, it's probably the most important picture of his long career. It sums up the spirit of fauvism better than any other single work. So what you can kind of do is go back and look at what the fauvist, what he had done so far and say, well, why is this a summary? Um, and I think that would be a good idea. Uh, but I can kind of tell you what other students say. They say, well, look, this, none of these colors have anything to do with each other. And when you look at some of these, are they trees, whatever, they seem to be in the foreground and the background at the same time. Uh, and then it's also this like kind of female nude figure, um, perhaps showing a symbolism of everything that is right or good or pure, something along those lines. Um, and the color scheme, again, this is like appealing to me, but at the time people thought that they, that this was not what you should do. Like you don't put yellow and pink together. Um, but again, artists had kind of seen what Van Gogh was doing and tried to take it to the next step. So the influence of African art, um, and this influence is one way to think about this is always look at it through the lens of imperialism. Because if you're living in a country that is colonizing other places of the world, um, there's a lot of things that you won't be aware of the way you're thinking of other countries. Uh, so a lot of... <clears throat> A lot of artists were influenced by African art, uh, but at the same time, they were seeing people around the world as being more primitive than them, even though the art 
is more advanced <laughs> kind of objectively as far as what the um, European artists are trying to do at this time. Um, so with this one, the blue nude memory of Biskra, um, he says, I do not create a woman, I paint a picture. In other words, a lot of critics looked at this and they complain, well, that doesn't look like a woman's body and that's fine because that's what we usually do, but it also doesn't look beautiful. Um, and this is the sculptural version. Um, you can decide whether or not you think it's beautiful. Other students say, I sometimes ask them, like, why do you think people didn't think this was beautiful? And they said, like, um, that the lines are kind of like hard and unnatural. Uh, and they're close to like what an ideal kind of femme body is, but um, he makes little changes that make it seem not right um, or even ugly. Uh, so we got that here. Um, and the influence with African art is really like, I'm not showing the African art here, uh, but a lot of Europeans looked at African art. They didn't understand why they were doing what they were doing. So they just said, oh, they can't, make um, images realistically or they're afraid. That's why everything looks scary. Um, and again, this is Europeans' point of view because they didn't understand <laughs> the art at all. Uh, but the artists like use this influence to kind of create their own ideas based on um, how African art was um, exaggerating and changing the forms of the human body. So this last one is a, um, or this current one, I'm gonna show you one more, is very tricky painting. Uh, so I often ask people when you see this pattern, is it in the foreground or the background? If you look at it, it's kind of both. Uh, so if you take a look at the lines here on the table, um, Matisse is kind of doing what Cezanne did. Um, there's a good line right here and this should look like a three dimensional table, um, but he shows it to us in a way like Cezanne would so that it's not entirely clear. Uh, sometimes you look at it and you're like, this is flat. Other times you look at it and you think, well, no, that's perfectly three dimensional. Look at all these lines and look at the chair next to it. So he uses a totally even red color, kind of like we saw with Cezanne using just one green color throughout the foreground and background. And it kind of enhances that trick where we're not sure what's in the foreground or in the background. Um, but all the lines are correct. If, if this was in black and white, you would see it as three-dimensional and wouldn't really think twice about it. Um, and then this, just like the painting we were looking at earlier, is that a picture on the wall or is that what's outside? Uh, he kind of purposely makes everything look flat outside um, to kind of um, lead us to what's real and what's a picture. So to kind of continue with that, he shows the studio and it's the same thing. He has his pictures in full color and then all the real things and just red. Uh, so again, we have this kind of like the lines are all correct and he even does a very tricky see-through glass here. Um, but he's kind of asking us the question, what's real? Is the reality that I'm putting inside of my paintings in full color, is that real? Um, we got a Van Gogh one up there. Um, or is the stuff that I put in red where all the lines are right, but it still looks flat, is that real? Uh, so these kind of like visual tricks were what interested artists at the time. Um, and other than the visual tricks, there isn't a whole lot of meaning, or at least the artist didn't intend any meaning beyond that. It's like, we're gonna try to do something new. So when you look at the other art style from this time period, cubism, it's the same idea. Uh, the artists are just like, how can we create something new? Uh, and they try not to think about what it means too much.